All right, so welcome to our second lesson. As we study through the letters written to the Hebrews, we'll do a verse by verse uh, study again. Our desire is to get the original communication of this guy. You know, sometimes we could preach anything out of this letter, but if we don't explain what this guy was trying to say, we would have made error. What we need to f first and foremost know is that what was he trying to communicate through this letter? And again, it's a letter. So we must be reading. We shouldn't be taking too much time. Last time we took uh, a lot of time because it was an introduction, but today we're going to see that we're going to be reading a lot. We are hoping to get to chapter 4 today. But otherwise, what we saw in the previous lesson is that Jesus is uh, far greater than angels, and therefore we must give the more energy to the salvation that he has brought to us. Amen? In case you missed what I was saying in the first lesson, that was my main point. Now, on page number 5, of, um, of your notes, we are going to jump straight into Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 5, where it says, Jesus Christ the man. So, having established that Jesus is God, far greater than angels, for the Jews, they would have said, but we know this guy is a man. We saw him going to the toilet, and he was sleeping, and he would sweat, and sometimes he would say, I am tired. You are telling us that this guy is God. So he then goes into length in chapter 2 to explain why he became a man. And again, he's not going to do it abruptly. He's going to use the scriptures. Because the scriptures, we're talking about Jesus. And he's going to show from the scriptures why he became a human being. And we know that the scriptures are Old Testament, Genesis to Malachi. Now, let's read. Uh, I'll read verse number, Hebrews chapter 2 from verse number 5 to 9. So he says, for he has put the world to come, of which we speak in, in subjection to, uh, sorry. For he has not put the world to come, of which we speak in subjection to angels. I'm, again, I'm reading from the New King James. So he's saying he has not put the world to come under the subject of angels, right? But one testified in a certain place saying, what is man? Now, when you see, it says, but one testified in a certain place. It's in the scriptures. And this quotation is actually from Psalm chapter 8. Amen? It says, what is man that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor. And set him over the works of your hands. You have put all things in subjection under his feet. That's the quotation from Psalm 8, right? It goes on to say, For in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we do not yet see all things put under him, under men, right? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. So he says in Psalm, two, Psalm 8, what we see there, when he says, who is man that you've made him so splendorous? And he said, you made him a little lower than angels. Now, you will hear people say this, and it's true, that the word uh, that was translated angels there is Elohim, and I've put it in your notes, it's used over 2,000 times, it was, trans it was translated God, not angels, right? And that's fine. But in context, here in context, the same word could be used for angels, right? Because he's showing that Jesus is far greater than angels. He's talking about angels. So it's correct translation to say, you made men a little lower than angels. And he then explained that this man who was made a little lower than angels is actually Jesus. So Psalm 8 is talking about Jesus. And verse number 9 is the key. He says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory. So he was made a little lower than angels so that he would suffer death. That was the only reason he became a human being. If he didn't have to die, there was no reason he was going to become a human being. He was always going to be greater than angels as God, as creator. But for the sake of dying for you and me, that is why he became a human being. I'll continue reading. So he says, uh, verse number nine, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than angels for the suffering of death, 
crowned with glory and honor that he by the grace of God might taste death for everyone. Again, let me read again from the NLT, from the New Living Translation. It says, What we do see is Jesus, who for a little while, just for about 33 years, was given a position lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Amen. Amen. That's the key. That's the reason why he became what? A human being. I've put in your notes there, John chapter 12, verse 31 to 33. You know, in John chapter 12, Jesus is speaking, and it's again, it's towards the end of his ministry there. And Jesus said, Now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. And again, Andrew is a great teaching where he says the word he there, I mean the word men there was added. It's not there, it's in italics if you read in the King James. It's in italics, meaning the word is not supposed to be there. So it's, it's supposed to read that now is the judgment of the world. Now shall the prince of the world be cast out. And I, if I be lifted from the earth, will draw all unto me. Draw what? What all unto me? He's talking about judgment of the world. So he's saying, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all judgment unto me. And to prove it, the next statement says, this said signifying what death he should die. So the lifting up from the earth is talking about the way he would die on the cross. And it says, when I am lifted up from, uh, from the, uh, on, the, on the cross, I will draw all judgment upon me. That's what he says, he tasted death for everyone. He suffered the, the punishment for every human being. And that is the reason why God became a human being. Amen? Let's continue reading in Hebrews. We are back in Hebrews chapter 2. Let me read again. Let me continue reading from the New King James Version here. It says, For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things in the beginning, in bringing many sons to glory, to make the captain of, our, of their salvation perfect through suffering. Man, allow me to read from the NLT. It's just more simple and more direct. It says, God, for whom and through whom everything was made, chose to bring many children into glory. And it was only right that, the, that he should make Jesus, through his suffering, a perfect leader fit to bring them into their salvation. So it was by God's choice that he says, this is what I'm going to do. You're going to be the, he, the, their leader or their savior through suffering. And this was also not abrupt. It was because it was always prophesied in the Old Testament. Now, I'll say this and we'll prove it later. Because of what I say that we are focusing more on the epistles, it doesn't mean we're going to throw away the Old Testament. But understanding the epistles or these things that I'm explaining will make us even appreciate the Old Testament more. Because now when you go to the Old Testament, you are busy looking for Jesus. And when you see Jesus, you celebrate. And there are patterns and pictures which are there in Judaism, in the Old Covenant, which were pointing to a truth that will be done in the New Covenant. And we can now always think and say, oh, that is why Jesus did this, or that is why Moses commanded him to do this. So it's Something that was prophesied that day in the Old Testament, that was fulfilled in the New Testament. And because of the epistles, we can now see the reality. Oh, that's what it meant. And the Bible becomes one great thing that we embrace, but we embrace it with knowledge. We know the Old Testament was a relationship between God and the Jews, and they were prophesying about Jesus who lived and fulfilled these things in the Gospels, but we find ourselves in the epistles. Amen? So, this aspect of suffering it had always been there. Each time they would sacrifice a lamb, it was showing that people would be saved by killing someone, by blood. Blood is what takes care of sins. And that's what we now see in Jesus. It was because God ordained it that way. These are the rules and laws that he gave to Moses, trying to paint a picture of what would happen to Jesus one day. Verse number 11. So now Jesus and the ones he makes holy, man, you and me, have been made holy. That's what he's even saying there. But anyway, now Jesus and the one he makes more holy have the same father. It's Jesus who makes you holy, not your, your actions. Amen? 
Now we have the same father. That is why Jesus is not ashamed to call them his brothers and sisters. For he said to God, then we are back again in the scriptures. This is how we use the scriptures. We go and see what Jesus said or what was said about Jesus. And you are speaking there in the scriptures. Now, this quotation, let me see, did I give it to you? Yes. It's a quotation directly from the prophet. From the, ah, this is from Psalm 22. Then the next verse will be a quotation from Isaiah 8. Now, hear what Jesus said to God. Verse number 12. For he said to God, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. I will praise you among your assembled people. So the fact that he says, to my brothers and sisters, it means we are now of the same father. That's what he's saying. Amen? Jesus is not ashamed to call you brothers and sisters. Verse number 13. He also said, I will put my trust in him. That is, I and the children God has given me. This was Jesus speaking. I've never heard a single sermon where people quoted Isaiah 8 this way. Never. Yet it's there. This is how we use Isaiah. Amen? So Jesus, because he says, I and the children God has given me, it means we are of the same family. God is now our father. And it was because Jesus died for us. Verse number 14. Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. It's because you and me are flesh and blood. That's why he also became a human being. Though he initially and truly his identity is God. For only as a human being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Man, Jesus' death did more than just pay for our sins. He took the sting of death. He took away the shame of death. He took away the fear of death. Verse number 15. Only this way could he set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. If you truly understand that Jesus died, and guess what? He defeated death. That's why he rose. It means you and I, when we die, will also rise. So we don't have to fear death. Death is just like sleeping. You, are, you, are you afraid of going to bed? Isn't it you go peaceful and you know that tomorrow I'm just going to wake up? That's what dying is like. It's not the end. But to those who are hopeless, it's the end. That's why people scream and are afraid to die. We know that there's judgment afterwards, but even First John 4 tells us that we can have boldness on the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we. We've got nothing to fear in death and even after death. Let me give you an analogy to show you what death is like. It's really nothing. It's not a big deal. The only thing that we mourn for is probably that we are leaving children and other relatives around. But guess what? God will take care of them. Don't worry about them. God, you, this world has been going on for 6,000 years before you showed up on the scene. And you think we're pretty going well, eh? I'm sure if you leave, the world will continue. But anyway, I heard the story of these two twins who were in the womb of their mother. And they were speaking to one another. Then one of them says, hey, do you think... There is life after this time here in the womb. Then the other one says, you don't be silly. What life? There is nothing after this. This is everything that there is. Then the other one says, don't you think we'll, maybe we'll be able to, to see other things? And you know, see th things more than what we are seeing, this darkness. He says, come on. He says, maybe we'll be able even to eat with our mouth and we don't need this umbilical cord here. Then he says, there's nothing like that. If, it was, if there was life... After, they would have some people coming from that life and coming here as well. And the other one says, I just wonder. Maybe we'll even be able to walk and even talk, listen to music. And he says, you are just daydreaming. Then the other one says, maybe we can even meet mother. Then he says, there's nothing called mother. What are you talking about? He says, he even said what he says. Maybe... Maybe she's around us. This is mother. Where we are, this is mother. He says, there's nothing, man. There's no mother. There's nothing after this. There's no proof. Has, has anyone ever come from the other side and come back to us and told us these things? He says, no. And that was that kind of conversation. But the thing is, 
obviously it was talking about people believing in God, right? He's all around us, just like babies in a womb. But for me, what, I, what I've seen in children, when they get born, they normally cry. Why? Because that warm um, um, amniotic fluid would have gone and they now feel the wind and the cold temperature out here. So they cry is a different environment. Maybe the light is just too bright for them. But guess what? If they knew what this life has to offer, that you can walk, you can see, you can fall in love, you can listen to music and all these things that life, this life has to offer as compared to the womb, they won't cry. They would celebrate. And it's the same thing with the death. Because on the other side, man, you won't feel pain, you won't feel sick, you won't die, there will be no suffering. Who would cry to, go, to be going that side? But just like babies cry because they don't know. Sometimes we do this and that. But otherwise, death, because of what Jesus has done, he has taken away the fear of death. Because we know that because he's gone ahead of us, there's a new way there. There's a life after this. A much better life than this. And it's because Jesus became a human being and he died for us. Only by dying could he break the power of the devil. Amen? Verse number 16. We also know that the son did not come to help angels. He came to help descendants of Abraham. Or in other words, he came to help human beings. That is what he's trying to say. Now, verse number 17. This is key. Therefore, it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters. So can you see from verse number 5, he's just been trying to show us how, why Jesus became a human being. Otherwise, his true identity is God. But he became, he became a human being to suffer for us, to die for us, to break the fear of death and all these things. But here is another very important point which becomes the main theme of the rest of the letter. He says it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. Then he could offer a sacrifice that would take away the sins of the people. So this was the main, this one was one of the main reasons why Jesus became a human being. So that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest. And by doing so, he could take away the sins of the people. Now, this statement to say Jesus could be our merciful and faithful high priest. For us, we might read it and just let it go like that. But for the Jews, it would sound like Keith is the next king in the throne in UK. Keith Chigondomi, a Zimbabwean, Anova Gunjanja, this one coming from here. I am the next one in the throne after the queen goes. That's how heretic it sounded. Because the Jews knew what a priest is, let alone a high priest. Yes, I put it in your notes there. On page 6, where it says G, Jesus has now become our high priest, right? Now, this was a mouthful to the Jews because, let's go to Numbers chapter 3. Let's see what this is saying. And again, this issue of high priests, you don't find it anywhere else in the Bible, in the New Testament, except in Hebrews. So if you don't read Hebrews, you won't ever get it. You won't get it. Yet, this identity of Jesus as the high priest is probably the most important identity of Jesus from the Old Testament. From all the 39 books, this writer brings out Jesus as the high priest. That's the main thing that he talks about from the Bible. The whole Old Testament. Honestly, high priest. And the church has not caught it. Again, he only says this to the Jews because only Jews could understand what a priest is in the high priest. You don't find it in Colossians, Corinthians, Galatians, because we don't know what a high priest is. Amen? Now, the church has not caught it because I can ask you, how many of you know songs that refer to God as Jehovah Jireh? You can just raise your hand. Jehovah Jireh. Baba, no song. Jehovah Jireh. Hallelujah. Songs that talk of him as the Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega. Yet, in Hebrews, writing to people who had the Old Testament, who knew the scriptures, he brings out Jesus as the high priest. Now, how many of you know songs that talk of Jesus as the high priest? Come on now. High priest. No songs. 
because the church has not caught that revelation of Jesus as the high priest. And this is a lot of applications we shall see as we go through the lessons. So now, in Numbers chapter 3, hear what God was commanding Moses about the priests. Verse number 1 to 3 of Numbers 3. This is the family line of Aaron and Moses, as was recorded when the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai. The names of Aaron's sons were Nadab, the oldest, Abayu, Eliezer, Ithamar. These sons of Aaron were ordained, were anointed and ordained to minister as priests. Now, jump to verse number 10. Appoint Aaron and his sons to carry out the duties of the priesthood. Aaron and his sons. And he says, but any unauthorized person, Jesus included, any unauthorized person who is not a son of Aaron, who goes too near the sanctuary, must be put to death. This includes Jesus. So when you say Jesus has become the high priest, someone will want to pick stones and say, what are you saying? It's the same as saying Keith is now the king in England. I'm not even of royal blood. I'm not even a citizen of that nation. How can I be? And that's what the Jew understood, to say, no, it can't be. Jesus cannot be a priest, the high priest, let alone the priest. And guess what? In case you, you are not sure about this, if you read number 16, I've put there, there's the issue of Korah. I normally say Korah Akadakushi, Koresa. He tried to challenge this office of the priesthood. And Moses was so bold to say, you are not going to die a normal death. Why? Because Moses knew what God said in Numbers 3. You are not going to die a normal death. Because you have challenged Aaron. And for sure the earth opened, and Korah, and his family, and even all their animals and possessions were swallowed by the earth. Because they, uh, they approached this office. So even Jesus could not approach this office. We shall see it in tomorrow's lesson that he to be appointed. Amen? And in Numbers chapter 17, that's where God then says, let's make this clear. He, brought the, he says, let each tribe bring a staff and we see which staff is buds to show who are chosen to be priests, right? Then Numbers 18 shows you the duties of the priest. So now when you understand that Jesus is the new high priest, you can go and read these chapters in Numbers enjoying them because you are looking at Jesus. They don't become heavy and just a burden when you read them. Anyway, we are back in Numbers chapter, sorry, in Hebrews. Let's go back to Hebrews. We had read verse number 17 in chapter 2, right? To show that Jesus has become our merciful and faithful high priest. Verse number 18. Since he himself has gone through suffering and testing, he is able to help us when we are being tested. So now Jesus is able to help us when we are being tested. Amen? Now, uh, we shall see this testing as we end today's lesson, how he helps us. Chapter 3, verse number 1. Remember, there were no chapters and verses in the beginning, so it's just a continuation of what we've just read. And so, dear brothers and sisters, who belong to God and are partners with those called to heaven, think carefully about this Jesus, whom we declare to be God's messenger and high priest. He even says, take some time to study and think, ponder, consider what it means for Jesus to be high priest. And that's what we're going to be doing in this letter. That's the thrust of this letter. To show you that Jesus is the high priest and what it means. And again, you don't find it anywhere else in the Bible. In fact, the word priest, if you do a word search, you find it, now when I say epistles, I'm saying from Romans to the end of the Bible, to Revelations, right? After the historic account in Acts. You only find it twice in First Peter. You find it three times in Revelations. And in those cases, it's not talking about Jesus. We shall see what it's talking about. Then you find it 34 times in Hebrews, the word priest. You can see the emphasis was trying to do this, talk to the Jews about this. And you're saying out of the whole Old Testament, the identity that he brings out of who Jesus is, is a high priest. And sadly, the church has not caught it. So anyway, he says, take some time to understand what it means. And thank God, because today we've got the Old Testament in our hands. We've got the scriptures. We can study the scriptures and see what it means for Jesus to be high priest. Verse number two in Hebrews chapter three. For he was faithful to God, who appointed to him just as Moses served faithfully when he was entrusted with God's entire house. Now, he is not brought in Moses. 
and he's going to compare Jesus with Moses. We saw that Jesus is higher than, much greater than angels. Now he's even going to show that Jesus is greater than Moses. And Moses was revered eh? in, in Israel for the Jews. Moses was a champion. In John 9, we won't take time to look there. There was a guy who was healed, was born blind. And when the Pharisees, they had about four encounters with this guy asking him. And one time they asked him, tell us, who, who healed you? Who made you see, man? Because this guy is a sinner. He, because he did on a Sabbath. He's breaking the law of Moses. That's what they were saying. Then the man even went on to say, you, do you want to be? I've told you. That is Jesus. Do you want to be his disciples? And the Bible said they ridiculed him. If the Bible could contain profanity, that you would find in John 9. Get away. What, what, what? They spoke bad things to him. And says, we are disciples of Moses, of this fellow we don't know. Imagine, they rejected Jesus. says, we are disciples of Moses. So now, in Hebrews, he's going to compare Jesus with Moses. And show that Moses is a little boy compared to Jesus. <laughs> you know, one of the reasons why we don't know where Moses was buried. There would have been a shrine. They, they would have built things there, a church, a synagogue there. But God had to make sure nobody knows where Moses was buried. Because, hey, Moses was huge. He was big. He was greatly revered in Israel. So anyway, verse number three. But Jesus deserved far more glory than Moses. Just as a person who builds a house deserves more praise than the house itself. So if you were to compare Jesus and Moses, it would be like comparing a builder and a house. Verse number four. For every house is a builder, but the one who builds everything is God. Again, verse number three tells us that Jesus is a builder. In verse number, sorry, verse number, yeah, verse number four then tells us the builder is God. Again, telling you that Jesus is God. He's the builder of everything. He's the one who created this Moses that you're talking about. But verse number five, I like it. It says, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant. His work was an illustration of the truths God would reveal later. So if you read Moses, you find illustrations of certain truths that God would reveal later. And that later is in the epistles. Like what we are reading in Hebrews. We are now being shown what the illustrations and what Moses was writing about actually means. The truth of the matter. What we see there is not a truth, it's a shadow. The truth is now what we see is being explained in the explanation in the epistles. So Moses is described as a servant in verse number 5. Verse number 6 says, but Christ is the son. So again, if you compare Moses and, and Jesus, Moses is a servant and Christ is a son. And you and me have been made sons, not servants, please. Amen? Your first and foremost identity is the son, not a servant. So, verse number six, but Christ as son is in charge of God's entire house. And we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Now, that last point of verse number six is key. The way we continue to be part of God's family, the way we continue in this faith, in this salvation, is if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Not in your works. But in Christ, in what Christ has done for you. Now, from verse number 7 to chapter 4, we are going to be looking at an incident that happened in Numbers 14. Again. Now, this is a quotation again from Psalm 95. That's what we're going to be mainly looking at in Hebrews. But it refers to the story in Numbers 13 and 14. I've heard a number of sermons from Numbers 13 and 14, but none of them were ever preaching the truth that the New Testament teaches about Numbers 13 and 14. God says to the children of Israel, I'm giving you land. Amen? A land that flows with milk and honey. They went, so they chose 12 uh, representatives, one from each tribe. And Joshua and Caleb were among these guys. They went there. After exploring the land, they came back. And they reported what they got to Moses. Now what happened is that uh, the 10 guys said, this, the land is good, but we can't get it. There are giants in that place. Only Joshua and Caleb said, we can get this land. And, Moses, and these guys tried to quieten them. Because at the beginning of the chapter, God says, tell them to go and scout the land that I am giving them. I've already given them this land. It's a done deal. But the people did not believe God. 
You see? So, and God, because of that, he swore that they would never enter that land. Because of unbelief. Because they did not believe what God had said. And this is the exhortation that let us hold on to what God has said about us, what Jesus has done about us. It's not about what you do. Let's just believe what God has said. Amen? So now let's read. Hebrews chapter 3, verse number 7. That is why the Holy Spirit says, Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled, when they tested me in the wilderness. There your ancestors tested and tried my patience, even though they saw my miracles for 40 years. So I was angry with them, and I said, their hearts always turn away from me. They refuse to do what I tell them. So in my anger, I took an oath. They will never enter my place of rest. Why? Because they did not believe, right? They refused what I tell them. And what God said, they will never enter my place of rest. He says, anyone who is 20 years and above will not enter that place. And for sure, he made them um, just wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And it was because these spies had gone, these 12 guys had gone into the land for 40 days. So one day for one year. And in those, because they were in the land for 40 days scouting the land, so I'm going to make you spend 40 years in the wilderness. And during that time, I will make sure anyone who's 20 years and above will die. And for sure they died except Joshua and Caleb. Imagine Aaron the high priest also died. Moses himself also died and failed to enter the promised land. Just because what God said. And now the exhortation is, guys, let us hold on to what God has said to us. Now, verse number 12. Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving. Turning you away from the living God. So it is only... An evil heart of unbelief, an unbelieving heart which will make you turn away from God or which will make you not obtain every promise that God has for you. Verse number 13. You must warn each other every day while it is still today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God. Now this is key. Sin will not make you lose your salvation. But sin will make you hardened towards God. And when you get hardened towards God, you end up in a heart, with a heart of unbelief. That is the challenge of sin. If you entertain sin, God has forgiven you of the sin. But if you entertain it and you get to a point where you harden your heart and you turn away from God, we shall see it in chapter 6, we shall see it in chapter 10. He addresses this thing. If we turn away, chapter 2, we actually saw it where he says, Let's, we drift away. That's drifting away when you harden your heart and drift away from God. Then you get to a point of unbelief. And that's when you get there. That's when it's dangerous. Amen? Verse number 14. For if we are faithful to the end, trusting God as firmly as when we first believed, we shall share in all that belongs to Christ. So can you see the key? It is to continue trusting God as firmly as we believed or when we first believed. And what did you believe? The gospel that Jesus died for you. That is what we should hold on firmly to. Not all these other things that people have come up with today. Methods and tricks and steps and all those things. And they, they make the people of God get back into works. Yet it's about faith, about grace, what God has done for us. Anyway, verse number 15. Remember what it says. Today when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Verse number 16. And who was it who rebelled against God? Even though they had heard his voice. Wasn't it the people Moses led out of Egypt? And you find that story in Numbers 13 and 14. Verse 17. And who made God angry for 40 years? Wasn't it the people who sinned, whose corpses lay in the wilderness? And to whom was God speaking when he took an oath that they would never enter his rest? Wasn't it the people who disobeyed him? Verse number 19. So we see that because of their unbelief, they were unable to enter his rest. So the thing that makes you fail to enter rest was what? Unbelief. It's very simple. Yeah, amen? Now, chapter 4. We continue. God's promise for entering his rest still stands. 
So we ought to tremble with fear that some of you might fail to experience it. Now this is interesting. Now he's bringing it home. We've, told about, we've been told about Israel. Now how do we apply it for you and me? He says this rest, this promise to enter into rest still stands. This promise is still alive. It is going to show us through the scriptures how this promise of entering this rest is still there. Or entering this promised land is still there, even today. For this good news that God has prepared his, this rest has been announced to us just as it was to them. But it did not but it did them no good because they did not share the faith of those who listened to God. For only we who believe can enter his rest as the other as for the others God said in my anger I took an oath they will never enter my place on, of rest even though this rest has been ready since the since he made the world now this is good so what he's saying again is in verse 1 there is still a promise to enter into rest today available for everyone you and me as well included but the people back then who failed to enter the rest is because they did not believe the message that's why they did not enter into rest when god said i'm giving you this place this land which flows with milk and honey they did not believe it and because they did not believe it they failed to enter but he then says in verse number three for only we who believe can enter his rest so the key is faith is belief what made them not to enter is unbelief what makes us to enter is belief or faith amen so we must stay in faith. Then as for those who didn't believe, that's the quotation that in my anger they will never enter my rest. But he then says the last part of verse number three. Even though this rest has been ready since he made the world. Now he is taking us to Genesis 1. That's when he made the world, right? And he says the rest has always been available since Genesis. And now he's now talking about the Sabbath rest. The true meaning of the Sabbath rest, not just the fourth commandment in the Ten Commandments. He's now explaining to us what the Sabbath actually meant. Sadly to say some people have made it one day out of seven. We shall see. Those who make it one day out of seven, we often ask them, do you rest for a year out of every seven years? And people ah, 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 ah. And this issue of not, of not working on Sabbath, turning... Switching on your stove is, re is working, right? Even switching on in, uh, the lights. I've heard there in Israel that they've got what they call Sabbath lifts. You just get in there, it goes to every floor and it always opens the door on a Sabbath. Why? So that you don't wake and you press fourth floor. It's work, it's considered work to press fourth floor. That's what we're talking about. So some of us who eat cold food on Saturday and think you're keeping the Sabbath. Oh... I've got sad news for you. That's not keeping the Sabbath. In fact, if you read carefully in Numbers, you are supposed to offer a sacrifice every Sabbath. So it's not just about not working. You need to offer that sacrifice prescribed by the law. Now, we are going to see what the Sabbath truly meant. Now, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, we are now in verse number 4. Amen. Now, verse number 4, it says, We know it is ready because of the place in the scriptures, again the scriptures, Genesis to Malachi, where it mentions the seventh day. And what does it say? On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Now that's Genesis 2.2. 2. So he's saying this rest has always been available because we know that God rested on the seventh day. So now he links it with what the people normally call the seventh day or the Sabbath, right? Talking about this, the rest that God was taking the children of Israel into the promised land. Verse number five. But in the other passage, God said they will never enter my place of rest. So what he's saying is, God mentioned the rest in Genesis 2.2. That's why he starts talking about God resting. Then in Numbers, he offered them to enter into a place of a promised land, the place of rest. But they did not believe him. Then when you move from Numbers... You eventually come to Psalms. This is what you've been quoting, Psalm 95. It comes way later. And guess what? There's a guy called Joshua. After Numbers, we've got Deuteronomy. Then after Deuteronomy, we've got Joshua, the book of Joshua. That's chronological order, right? Then Joshua was here, but 
after Joshua had lived and he had even taken, Joshua is one of Joshua and Caleb, they had gone into the promised land. Later, years later, during David, he talks of a place called rest in Psalm 95. So it's saying what Joshua did was not taking them into the place of rest that God was talking about in Genesis 2.2. And that's what we're going to be reading now. So I'll read it again, verse number 5. But in another place, um, but in the other place, passage, sorry, God said they will never enter my place of rest. Verse number 6. So God's rest is there for people to enter. But those who first heard this good news failed to enter because they disobeyed God. And we know the disobedience was unbelief, right? Verse number 7. So God set another time for entering his rest. And that time is today. Today, as you are listening to me, it's a day of entering his rest as well. God announced this through David much later in the words already quoted. Today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Verse number eight. Now, if Joshua had succeeded in giving them the rest, this rest, God would not have spoken about another day of rest still to come. Some Bible, if you are reading King James, it would say Jesus. But if you are talking about Joshua, the one who succeeded Moses. Amen? He's not talking about Jesus, the Jesus we know. He's talking about Joshua. So he's saying, if God mentioned rest in Genesis chapter 2, then in Numbers, we see them failing to enter into the promised land. They wandered for 40 years. Then Joshua, soon after Moses, he managed to take the children of Israel into the promised land. Then why would God still talk of a day of rest in Psalm 95 through David many years later? It means the rest was not this thing that we see in Numbers, in Joshua's story. There is a rest. And just to give you a hint, the Bible was talking about Jesus. The person who actually takes you into the real rest is not Joshua or Moses. It's Jesus. And that's why that rest is available for us today. Jesus can make you enter into the true Sabbath, which is linked to Genesis 2 2 when God rested. Amen? Now, verse number nine. So there is a special rest still waiting for the people of God. Now, let's go back to Genesis 2. I want us to think through this one. Now, so God created the world in six days. Or let's say, yeah, in six days. Then on the seventh day, God rested, right? My question is, what did God do on the eighth day? He rested, right? On the ninth day, he was resting. Tenth day, up to now, God is still resting. And that is the true Sabbath. It's not one day out of seven. It's when you enter into a perpetual rest like God. And that's what we're going to see in the next verse, verse number 10. It says, For all who have entered into God's rest have rested from their labors, just as God did after creating the world. God did not go back to work on the eighth day. And he's saying you can enter a rest today where you enter into a perpetual rest and you cease from your works. You have rested from your labors. These labors we are talking about is when you are trying to work to, for God and earn your righteousness and earn a good standing before God. All those fasts that people have made us to do. Now, there's a right way of fasting, but in the most of the cases people have been fasting, God, hear me, or God, do this for me. You need to rest from those labors and stop fasting like this. It's not God, look, I'm doing my Bible reading, I'm going to church, I'm saving you in church so that you can bless me. No. I've heard of people who have done an Esther fast in order to get married. That's wrong, you're not in rest. You are depending on your works. God, see what I'm doing. I'm giving to the church. Can you see, God? I'm sowing so that you can now give me a car or you can give me a house or you can give me a spouse. You are still in your labors. And we are saying today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Open your heart and enter into rest where you now fully depend on what Jesus has done for you. Let him take you into this place of rest. Verse 11. So let us do our best to enter that rest. The King James says, let us labor to enter into rest. You have to actually put effort in order to enter into rest. Because it's not logical. People are used to doing works. I need to do this so that God can do that for me. But you need to labor to enter into this rest. And he says, but if we disobey God, 
Disobeying God, the commandment is today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Open your hearts and enter into rest. But if you disobey God and you choose to continue in your works, in your labors, and you don't want to enter into this rest, watch out. Hear what it says. I'll read verse number 11 again. So let us do our best to enter into that rest. But if we disobey God as the people of Israel did, we will fall. If you are going to continue relating to God through your works, you will fall. That's what he's saying. And verse number 12, in context, I know many times we've talking about it, but in context, it says, for the word of God, it starts with the conjunction for, is there because of what has been said. He says, if we don't enter into rest, we will fall. Why? Because the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. What does it do? It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. Let me take it from the NKJV. Verse number 12. Let me start from verse 11. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and join and marrows, and it is the discerner, it descends, right? It is the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, God can see your intentions when you fast or do all these things. Nothing is hid from him. He can see it if you are in rest or if you are in your labors, in your works. Verse number 13, there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked upon open and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. So the true Sabbath is entering into a perpetual rest where you stop relying on your works, but you cease. Right? Let me read verse number 10 from the New King James. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. So you enter into a place where you rest, where you cease from trying to earn your acceptance before God, you cease from your works and you rely on what Jesus has done for you. Amen? And if we don't do that, we are guaranteed we will fall. You know, this makes me think of uh, Ephesians 2. This might not be in your notes. This is probably in your, not in your notes, but you might want to write it down. Ephesians 2, verse number 8 and 9. It says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The reason why God saved us by grace, he does not want anyone to boast. He does not want anyone to say, man, look what I did. I sowed and now I got this. I fasted and now I got this. I did this and now God has done this. God doesn't want that. He doesn't want anyone to boast. He wants it to be by grace. It should be because of Jesus we have this. God has done this for me by grace. It's not by grace and your works. And that's the thrust of the letter written to the Galatians. And that's why even Andrew says Galatians is a key letter in understanding the grace of God. And this is the same message that is coming out even through what? Through Hebrews. Now, to end our lesson, in your notes, um, I've, got, I've put there on page number 8, Matthew 11, verse number 28 from the Message Bible. Then we'll end today's lesson. Matthew chapter 11, reading from the message translation of the Bible. From verse number 28 to the end. It says, Are you tired? Worn out? Burned out on religion? Come to me. By the way, this is Jesus speaking. Get away with me and you will recover your life. I will show you how to take a real rest. Jesus will lead you into a real Sabbath. Not one day out of seven days. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. When the Bible talks of a yoke, it's referring to the law. He says, I won't even give you any laws. That would be heavy on you. The kind of stuff that will command will be easy for you to do. 
And the main reason is because we would have changed our nature. We now want to live for God. Last part says, keep company with me and you will live, you will learn to live freely and lightly. But it says, I will show you how to take a real rest. And to the Jews, to whom we commanded the Sabbath and taking a rest, he explains what the true Sabbath is. He's entering the rest of God, which is still available for us today. Amen? So we will end here for today. And we will continue next time. Amen?